Aloha, everybody. Mingalaba. <laughs> Welcome to the Sunday sit. I think I'll say just take the time to maybe look, connect with each other by eye, eyesight. Hello. Good to see you all. What a range of time zones. <laughs> Okay, shall we get going? Is it an, ready? Okay. Um, I, I kind of felt like it might be helpful to just uh, become aware if you feel uh, connected with yourself or disconnected. Uh, and just, just to start there, to just notice that without judgment, just to notice if you feel rushed or frazzled or calm, connected, disconnected. And of course, then to start to um, let your attention land around your body, the surface of your skin, come inside your body, just easy, kind of slide in. And I'm gonna uh, point to my heart center. And if you do feel disconnected, just to, you can bring your hand to touch your heart. And this is very simple, it's just to receive the touch there, the contact there. And to see if just that touching and receiving the touching, if you feel any connection with yourself there. And then notice the quality of your awareness and notice if that contact there, the connecting there with your hands, receiving the touch, if there can be any warmth or kindness, care, tenderness. And just take a few breaths in and out of your heart center there. Long, deep breaths.
And notice if you can feel any um, calm, experiencing ease from the connection. Maybe there's an easier flow to the movement of the breath. And then if you can bring your awareness to your hands and just bring the hands together so that the thumbs are touching each other. And this is just like touching your heart center, but you're touching thumb to thumb. Feeling the connection there with kindness, care, tenderness. And just see if you can receive that, the goodness of that there, any well-being. And notice if this, there can be a quiet abiding with the sensations in your hands right now. So wherever your attention is naturally drawn, noticing that there is, we call this, connecting with the body sensations, touching, touching. And shifting from receiving kindness, care, to a quiet abiding with whatever sensations are appearing and disappearing there. It might be just very light vibrations, textures. Heaviness or warmth or coolness. Letting the attention, notice any thoughts like hands, thoughts about the experience like the word hands or warm, cool. Just letting the sensations quietly emerge. And just distinguishing between any thinking about the sensations. That's just thinking, no problem. Thoughts will come and go by themselves. Just bringing the attention to connect with this touching. Hands. We see that the word hands cannot describe this moment to moment aliveness of our body. And if you find it helpful, then you can put your hands touching your abdomen or belly. It's the same as the contact, connecting, touching. It 
first with care. Kindness, quiet abiding. You can sometimes feel the sacredness, the holiness of this movement of breath. If you're really quiet, it's like there has to be a kind of hush. just receiving this life just as it's happening. Connecting with this tidal movement, rising swell till it ends. And that falling of the wave till it disappears at the shore. Any words cannot describe this. We can say breath, rising, stretching, pressure, vibration, disappearing, particles, waves, and then we reconnect the attention with that mysterious emergence of life just as it is. Remembering that if any sounds call the attention that it's choiceless, your attention will be aware of hearing. Just like we've been doing the connecting, quiet abiding, that hush of quiet as we receive the life of sound. Appearing, disappearing. Or it could be some sensations in our body call, it's choiceless. Just remembering that, seeing if we can connect. Not from a visual image or memory from the past, they might come up. That's just thinking. No need to struggle with or push away. You just notice it, thought disappears. Reconnect with that, which is calling. Whether what is appearing is pleasant or unpleasant or neutral, Seeing if the attention can be kind. If there's a knee-jerk reaction of resistance, 
that's okay. That's what is calling the attention. That's what's, what's apparent or predominant. You just shift to being connected with resistance. Noticing any corresponding physical sensations. Noticing the quality of the mind or heart or judgment about resistance. Whatever emotion, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, that might appear or thoughts, as well as sounds, body sensations, breath. Connecting with this quiet, abiding, care, kindness. And then just seeing what happens. Watching out for any hidden agendas or expectations. Letting life be just as it is.
Today, I would like to speak about paramis. Sometimes parami is translated as uh, the 10 perfections um, or simply as supreme par param or paramita means um, gone beyond. We can see them as forces of goodness within and we can see them either as a result or as a cultivation. As a result, it's the experience we have when we're drawn to these teachings. However, we first may have come through inner reflection or reading or hearing Dhamma, eventually learning meditation. The the fulfillment of this of that process is from previous actions of the paramis. In the Theravada tradition, the way of the elders, the 10 paramis are generosity, uh, sila, non-harming, renunciation, wisdom, energy, and patience, Truthful, truthfulness, determination, loving kindness, equanimity. All are familiar. All you reflect upon or you experience or you hear in the context of our instructions, uh, Dhamma talks, uh, each, each one is um, a deep, field of merit. Um, and so as a result, for example, the generous nature that we feel when we start to practice and the natural letting go. Generosity is the expression of non-attachment. And as you know, it's often the beginning of the very ancient discourses of the Buddha. He starts with generosity and then teaches about the moral, ethical field of, con of conduct, our speech, our actions, our way of living. And then from that, he, he builds maybe those something inspiring with the Brahma Viharas or the Deva realms, and then the Four Noble Truths. A, a typical discourse like that is often expressed in the texts where the, thereby many of the disciples that he's speaking to uh, touch the unconditional. There's a shift in their consciousness because they take that transmission in and building on the generosity. So we could say that our, uh, the 10 paramis are, are requisites for awakening. They're the field of practice forces that, that both cause us to practice and to feel the process and fruit of our practice, as well as it's a, a cultivation here and now when we consciously practice generosity, uh, letting go, giving. In the larger picture, in the, the Theravada tradition, the way of the elders, um, these perfections can be practiced with the aim of, of becoming a Buddha. So there's a Bodhisattva tradition in the Theravada tradition. It can be practiced without that goal um, and without the context even of the traditional teachings. And one becomes what's called 
a Pacheka Buddha or a silent Buddha just becomes um, awakened because of the fruit of their paramis and, and not at all in the context of, of following a particular path. And perhaps the majority uh, of us practice as disciples of the Dhamma, of the truth. Uh, and then in that process, we learn about and practice the generosity, uh, the non-harming to become a safe person within ourselves, to orient ourselves away from um, any kind of oppression or harm of living beings. So to undertake, undertake these perfections um, is by degrees. Of course, if someone vows to become a Buddha in some future time, it's a very refined and profound level of, of practice and perfection of each of these. We don't have to practice to that degree of refinement and perfection, uh, just good enough. Uh, and, and we feel the maturation process. We feel enhanced by feeling that um, we can relinquish things that we have and, and feel the wisdom in doing so. That when we, when we practice dana, when we practice our generosity, if we do it with un understanding the selfless nature of it, understanding the intention of helping others, of caring for the welfare of others, this is its form as a, as a force of goodness as the dana parami, the generosity uh, surround that we create in our lives. And then it's, it's further developed or fulfilled in sila, becoming a safe person, a selfless person who has the intention not to harm any living beings. When we do our uh, practices, you know, we just finished a six day retreat few days ago, the reason we take the precepts of non-harming is not to adhere to commandments or uh, an imposed morality, uh, but the Buddha taught the, these qualities, these precepts of non-harming as, as a way of understanding our psychological landscape and as stepping stones to serenity, concentration, and insight wisdom. So it's, it's not, it's different than traditions that have commandments not to kill. We present it as a practice in, in the way of the Theravada tradition, the practice of not killing. And we take that precepts and the practice of not taking what's not freely offered and the practice of right speech, aligning with truth which is uh, the aim of our practice, being fulfilled and liberated through truth. So sila then is further fulfilled and refined in renunciation. Renunciation is a turning away from the, the obstacles of calm and insight, uh, relinquishing our, our, our ties uh, to be tethered to forces of attachment and aversion. Renunciation is another word for meditation. In that way, it can, it can mean moment to moment letting go, moment to go, moment release. And each time, each parami, uh, when seen in succession in the way I'm talking about them, that generosity is further fulfilled and manifested, expressed in, in non-harming, in sila. And that is further refined uh, because we let go or we relinquish our, our tethers to sense, 
attachment to sense, platter, uh, sense pleasures and fear and aversion, repulsion of, of uh, whatever is unpleasant in our experience and feel that, uh, that spaciousness that comes from the practice of renunciation. That the, it's the ultimate generosity, it's the ultimate gift to ourselves and with the intention of practicing for the welfare of all beings everywhere. When we finished our retreat the other day, we did a, a sharing of the merit meditation where we acknowledge the accumulated forces these paramis of generosity, loving kindness, wisdom, and so forth. And then the practice is to share them with all beings, a visceral felt sense, giving, relinquishment. Does it decrease those forces within us? No, it's just the opposite. It increases us when we relinquish, when we let go. Uh, as each of these paramis are further fulfilled, in the meditative mind. And then from renunciation, which is the same as meditation, comes seeing things as they are, the wisdom parami. Uh, renunciation is perfected and purified by seeing the as it is nature of, the, of this body, its sensations, its pains and pleasures. And this very mind, the thought formations, emotions, mental moods and so forth and how, what we, how we observe the same in other living beings. The wisdom that understands and works for the welfare of others, motivated by seeing things as they are. And we know that other beings like ourselves uh, face stress and anxiety, you know, all the forms of dukkha uh, because of the changing nature of everything all the time inwardly and outwardly. Part of wisdom is to see both the unique and universal nature of experience. An example of unique nature, uh, particular sensations like pressure, like numbness, like heat, uh, like sensation of expanding or compression Another example of unique nature is a particular uh, mental mood or emotion, courage, or fear, doubt, or confidence. Universal nature is that all these unique phenomena, physical, mental, what we see here, uh, smell, taste, and so forth, are, are all subject to the law of impermanence, the nature of the ephemeral quality of life and the underlying unease about that, unsatisfactoriness, unreliability, the dukkha nature. The more wisdom, the more the motivation to practice for uh, the welfare and sake of other beings, ourselves included. But the orientation is helped by aiming at helping others. That's what, that's what strengthens these forces of goodness, these paramis, and, and takes them to their highest level. Each parami is accompanied by compassion and skillful means. Skillful means just uh, applied wisdom, we could say, uh, just knowing the right time to do things, very similar to clear, clear comprehension knowing what we were doing, knowing what we want, uh, and attuning to the appropriateness or timing, the flexibility. So compassion, skillful means are cultivated alongside of each of these. Energy arises from the wise consideration of wisdom. As we're seeing things and understanding uh, this nature, this anatta nature, selfless nature of ourselves, the energy builds, bodily energy, mental energy. It's a, it's a parami, it's a dhamma energy, uh, not just any kind of energy. It's a very special energy applied uh, 
very intimately to moment to moment experience. Uh, it's, it's the energy to stay with our practice and it's the energy to practice uh, for the welfare of other beings. The, the energy is balanced from equanimity, the 10th parami. It's kept in check so we don't overstrive and, and we don't stagnate. Just attune in the right way. The energetic meditation that we do is further fulfilled in, in the parami of patience. The ability to, to be with this, this nature of bodily and mental experiential continuous change, the ability to attune to it and not be overwhelmed by the formations, the mental and physical formations that that cause or a cause of dukkha from our clinging, from our searching for anything. Um, patience is both the acceptance in the moment of what's happening as well as a non-opposition. So whatever's happening, say there's a lot of uh, physical pain or emotional pain, and then also say there's resistance to experiencing that physical pain or emotional pain. Well, acceptance is holding all of that, uh, the non-opposition to the resistance so that we understand the, the, the resistance uh, as well as the non-opposition to what it is we're resisting. Painful physical sensations or unhappy mental states or uh, difficult uh, experience in, in daily life. During this pandemic era, we're putting all these paramis to practice. They are what are helping hold us together uh, through our own personal practices at home. And when we meet here as a, as a sangha on Sundays or when we do retreats, it's, it's these, these paramis that uh, establish the base in generosity and further fulfillment in non-harming and the relinquishment that comes from renunciation uh, and its uh, manifestation in wisdom and seeing the as it is nature of things that further, that for, further motivates us to practice, to alleviate the dukkha. So we're quite aware of what's happening in the pandemic world, even if we only let little bits of it in at a time. Whatever our response is, uh, that is caring or sensitive or uh, often it's being overwhelmed by it and feeling uh, sad, you know, or feeling the grief, feeling the depression for suffering beings on the planet. But we have these practice tools. So the paramis are, are restorative. If we reflect a little bit on it, use wise reflection, which is a form of the wisdom and use this establishment in patience, the acceptance of what's happening right now and, and the um, uh, non-opposition so that we create the space to see clearly and act out of that uh, stable space. One of the renowned um, monks of the time of the Buddha, name was Anuruddha. Uh, and he was sick at one time. He was renowned because he was known for his meditative powers. It's, he was uh, highly enlightened in wisdom, but he also had uh, these concentration powers. And particularly he was known for having the, what's called the divine eye. He could see things far away or, or see into other realms of existence you know, where there are subtle beings like devas and whatnot. So he was sick. He was sick at one time and then two monastics came and asked him how he was doing. You know, if his symptoms were 
increasing or decreasing and he was putting up with things as enduring um, the pain and not or being overwhelmed by it. Um, and he, he said, he said, the disease is not becoming appeased. Uh, it's difficult to endure. Uh, and the pains of my body are gradually increasing, not decreasing. And he said, it's as if a strong person uh, put a rope around the head of a weaker person and, and pulled both ends so tight, so tight that the person was in extreme pain. And Anuruddha said to his monastic friends, my pain exceeds that. And further, it's as if, a, um, imagine a, a butcher cutting open the belly of a cow and taking out the organs. You know, how, how could a cow endure this pain? And Anuruddha said, my belly is now more painful than that of the cow that's being cut up. And thirdly, he said, um, imagine strong persons hanging a weak person over a fire uh, so that that person's feet are roasted. And he said, my feet uh, are exceed that, the pain in my feet far exceed uh, the roasted feet of that person hanging from the fire. So his head, his belly, his feet, you know, <laughs> just an abject pain and, and um, among his meditative powers uh, are the po is the power of cessation of perception and feeling. He could very easily just drop into that. He could very easily be removed from the pain by resolving using determination, uh, the eighth parami, to go into that non-perception uh, and non-feeling but he doesn't. So even though my body uh, has come to be in such pain, I, I will endure it. I'll endure it with mindfulness and clear comprehension. And, and so he says, the pains are rising in the body. Uh, I will feel as my pain. I will feel just as they are with mindfulness and clear comprehension established by mindfulness, contemplating the body as the body, established uh, with mindfulness in contemplation as feelings as feelings and established in the uh, contemplation of, of the mind, chitta, the heart mind as the heart mind, just as it is the thoughts, emotions, mental states and establish in the dhammas, you know, phenomena, all other phenomena, just as it is established, contemplating phenomena coming and going. This is how I will overcome my illness. And it's exactly what he did. He practiced with the four foundations, mindfulness, clear comprehension, until, until he was healed, until he was better. It's inspiring to see these stories and uh, uh, similar discourses. Uh, when the Buddha was sick, our other monastics, nuns and monks, they often talk about how to use the practice uh, to deal with illness, the aging, sickness, disease, uh, as a as a entry point uh, for awakening instead of a place, you know, where you suppress or try and get away from the, the symptoms and the disease, the very just truth of it and opening to it as it is. So from, from patience, um, truthfulness arises. The in, intention toward manifesting the truth in our, in our lives, in our actions. So particularly poignant, for example, is uh, truthfulness in speech. 
honesty and speech, honest self-assessment that uh, determines and assesses what our motivation is. What, what words do we carve out to use? And how, what's the form of delivery? Is it coming across uh, evenly? Is it sharp edged? Is, it, is there motivation behind it of, of you know, pushiness or a control, an agenda of manipulation? Looking really honestly at intention and motivation behind the words that with the truthfulness par me, we're careful how we use the word, the tone and what we use the words. And the underlying int intention of the speech in terms of its usefulness, appropriateness and timeliness. Yes, we practice the truth and manifest the truth and speak the truth. But in using our speech, we recognize it as a powerful form of expression and relation and interrelationship with others. So knowing the timeliness of it, just because something is true doesn't mean it's the appropriate time to speak it. We live and express this truthfulness um, through the reflection and acceptance of the anatta nature of beings. This is how this parami is described, attuning to the, the empty nature, empty of a solid, fixed, permanent, uh, sustaining, contracted self. Rather, we attune to other beings as, cha as changing process. And that attunement uh, helps us understand that all of, like ourselves, all beings are in this process, are, are hurting, are happy, are confused, are clear, just like ourselves. And so we use our truth, we use the embodiment and manifestation of our truth uh, to, to reflect that you know, all beings are our process. So, uh, there's no one there um, behind their, their actions. There's, there's no permanent self behind their, their suffering and their pursuit of happiness uh, and their, their ignorance or their wisdom. So understanding that uh, we, part of the truthfulness insight is the balance, the equanimity that comes in where <clears throat> we don't choose how and where and when and who we help. If we want the truth and if our aspiration is the embodiment and liberation through truth, uh, then our way of seeing to the welfare of others is not distinguishing you know, in that way. Um, along with each parami is, is compassion and skillful means. So again, it doesn't mean uh, that at times we don't try to correct error through setting up healthy boundaries and, and uh, relaying to others that their action or their behavior is harmful and are not helping you know, or confusing. Determination is, is the, as truthfulness matures and, and becomes of an unshakable quality in, in our process, our heart mind. And determination is the, the unshakable commitment to what we do. So in, and the example of truth as skillful speech, mindful speech, um, determination protects that truth, it protects that commitment, that loyalty to what's true and to acting and manifesting what's true skillfully and so forth. Determination is used a lot more than we might realize in practice. Sometimes in retreats, we give little resolves like to resolve to 
walk, if we're walking from A to B and it's 10 steps, we might make a, a very simple soft resolve. May the next five steps be with exceptional mindful awareness. Or make little resolves. Um, we'll often offer and encourage yogis to make little resolves in, in, in sitting practice when working either with very intense experience, intensely pleasurable or intensely painful, or little resolves that uh, nurture our progress you know, toward more understanding, toward more insight, toward more loving kindness, toward the development you know, of the paramis. All of these qualities, um, generosity and non-harming, uh, the expression of, of non-attachment and renunciation, and the ability to start living as we're attuned to things as they are in and out of meditation, you know, still, we want to use that wisdom to connect with one's anatta nature, our own selfless nature and others' nature. Because if we're attuned that way to what's real, what's true, what, what is real experience, then what we, what we do will be skillful, will be motivated by that wisdom. And then that wisdom is, uh, is further manifested through this dhamma energy, bodily and mental dhamma energy that um, sees, attunes to the unique and universal nature. And, and uh, as a parami becomes more and more balanced, more and more refined. Uh, so like just the slightest little shifts, so the slightest little noticing of our inner workings of our motivation, our intention and within the mind process, the heart process has a big effect in, in shifting something that was sort of leaning more toward um, attachment to the Dhamma pleasures of concentration and, and serenity and so forth, you know, and back the other way, back into the middle. And that's where metta is so helpful from Determination is further fulfilled in the, uh, and perfected by the practice manifestation of loving kindness, unconditional love, love infused uh, with wisdom, abiding in this loving kindness uh, as all these other paramis are being developed. It's said that, that metta is the catalyst for all the paramis to awaken and to mature. Uh, and as you know, we, we, we put a lot of emphasis on the balance of the practices of loving kindness and compassion, and joy and equanimity with the wisdom practice of attuning to things as they are and opening to the truth of the underlying uh, dukkha nature because of things being impermanent and ephemeral uh, though our, our intention might be for happiness, uh, often by habit, we look for it in the wrong place. We think happiness comes from uh, the, the sense fields being pleasant or unpleasant experience being suppressed, avoided, and gotten rid of. Metta is uh, further purified with the last tenth parami of equanimity. Fulfilled imperturbability. That's the manifestation, that's the quality of, of equanimity.
I often find it helpful to, to just mentally scan the paramis and, and see which ones I can feel or which ones feel they need some attention and, and just like calling up Donna and, and feeling its characteristic of relinquishing or its uh, nature of, of non-attachment or attitude of fulfillment, abundance, prosperity, uh, or calling up renunciation and, and feeling the untethering of habit, you know, the, the go-to so as not to feel any kind of dukkha, any kind of um, reactivity. Um, and instead to aim for the Dhamma pleasures. Re renunciation is that fulfillment of generosity uh, with a with the pleasant experiences, the Dhamma joys and Dhamma happiness that come uh, from relinquishing and from being a safe person, uh, committing to non-harming. Um, the more we're aware of that quality of renunciation, the larger and more profound do we feel uh, the support of these Dhamma pleasures. It, they may, may not be at first seemingly as intense, you know, exciting as uh, some of the sense pleasures, uh, but they're the most trustworthy, they're the most real, and, and they are they're intimately a part of, of practice progression, part of the stepping stones of awakening. Or calling up wisdom, you know, at a time when we're uncertain in daily life, what's the wisest thing to do? Where is this parami? What is this parami of wisdom saying right now? What, what is the skillful action that can be taken? Just be quiet, you know, just listening, just feeling what's happening. This is a poem, William Stafford. Called Listening. My father could hear a little animal step or a moth in the dark against the screen. And every far sound called the listening out into places where the rest of us had never been. More spoke to him from the soft wild night than came to our porch for us on the wind. We would watch him look up and his face go keen to the walls of the world flared, widened. My father heard so much that we still stand inviting the quiet by turning the face, waiting for a time when something in the night will touch us too from that other place. Poems sometimes help uh, call up the felt sense of of these of these paramis, like using wise reflection uh, with wisdom to to experience its manifestation as non confusion, you know, the opposite of delusion or ignorance, uh, like a guide in the forest, as it's described in the texts, uh, or to reflect on either. Uh, the collectedness of samadhi or on the four noble truths as the proximate cause uh, for wisdom, liberating wisdom. This is a poem by Anna Swear. A double rapture because there is no me and because I feel how much there is no me. Reflecting on the energy parami, we can feel often the return of strength in the heart because it's, it's such a positive, good force 
that kind of energy, this, the parami of, of virya can't be used for harm. So if it's this good energy of, a, of the parami, we, we feel purity and strength in the heart and we feel the manifestation is uh, in, the, in, the fatigu, fig, in the fatigability <laughs> or we feel its spiritual urgency as a, as a force that motivates us. No? Remember that there's this distinguishing feature of compassion and skillful means with, with each of the paramis. If, if, and if, if, we're, if we're aware of that, how that holds and keeps us close to feeling like the acceptance, the characteristic of patience, our ability to endure the desirable and undesirable. Uh, to feel that characteristic of resolve with the parami of determination, resolving to manifest um, more metta for ourselves and for others, uh, making the little resolves that can be successful resolves to practice more renunciation or to cultivate more generosity. They're, they're, they're so interrelated, these paramis. But practicing any one of them has an effect on all of them. And you know how much we emphasize the loving kindness and the equanimity. Their great power, their great value is a supreme uh, emotional spiritual emotions. Let's just sit for a moment. See if you can feel these qualities, generosity, the virtue of non-harming, parami. The non-attachment comes from renunciation. We're clearly connecting with seeing the as it is nature, the anicca or anatta nature of beings with the wisdom parami. And that energetic, energetic good quality of courage and strength of heart from the energy part of me. Which one speaks to you? Patience, truthfulness, kindness, equanimity. So I think there's some time for questions. Um, if anybody has any for about the talk or the instructions or your practice, uh, just that reminder, if you click on the participants 
little button there on the bottom of your screen on the right hand side should show up the list of folks and at the bottom of that a little blue hand raise button so we can know that if you have a question. Sarah, wow, very late at night over there. Let's see. <laughs> can you unmute there? There we go. Yes. So hi everyone and thanks uh, Stephen for the talk and Michelle for the invitation. Um, I had a, a question about um, the fact that I am, um, I think I, uh, I am scared about the fact that I, um, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, my English is, be is becoming very poor these days. Uh, so how can I say it? I'm scared about the fact that I want to, I, I know that I can build good things, but also in, a few, you know, like quickly, I know that I can destroy a lot of things just because of, um, you know, some fears and the fact that they just, um, um, they just appearing in all of my body and all of my action is, um, is guided by those things. Um, and I was, <laughs> Um, I was actually wondering how um, I mean I know I, I have to practice but um, how to you know just to, to change this a little bit because this talk for example is really talking to me today because I really feel the, fa um, the fact that I can hurt people and and harm them, and and I don't want that. I don't like that. So, well, it's not really a question, but. Yeah. Do you ever see the, the fear side by side with courageous energy in your actions? I mean, can, can you can you see them kind of both being present? without needing to fix or change or get rid of the fear, having the attitude that... Yes, I can see, the, to... I, I can see the, the courage that you are talking about, but it's not going in a way um, um, not to harm people. It's actually going in this way. Like, it, it's like I want to just, you know, save my or protect myself and I, and I, and I need to, um, and it's just going in, in a way that I, I, I will obviously arm someone if I do it this way. So I see the courage, but not in the right way, the right direction uh, with the fear. You, so because you, you experience the fear as being stronger than the courage? Having... Yes, exactly, yes, mm -hmm. yes. I have a question. Am I, can you hear me? You can hear me. Oh, yes. Oh, can you hear me? Um, do you mean by harming, harming with your speech or do you mean with your action? Hmm. Harming with my speech. But it's, it's just because I, I, I have this, um, my entire body is saying you have to protect yourself. Right. And, right. And, and, and the next thing is, I mean, saying something, uh, mm -hmm. not because I want to harm, you know, like consciously, right. but because I need to protect me. And that's it. Okay. So I, I think that my a suggestion to try, because I think. Um, Are, are you aware of the fear and that wish to protect yourself before you say something? Yeah, I, I was, at, I mean, I had an experience this week, so that's why I'm talking about that. But yes, I had, 
And actually, I spent like a day saying nothing and taking a, a lot of distance with this. I tried. And at some point, you know, a day after, I just, everything just go out. So it was very annoying. Um, it's, it's really weird. <laughs> Well, no, these are deep patterns that we all live with, um, and uh, they're sometimes they're old conditioning and habits. Uh, and I, I kind of wonder if you had that much time, if you if you tried to connect with the fear and trying to restrain that long. I mean, sometimes it's. Um, we go through these things enough time where we do it again <laughs> right it's like and you say it again and um, you taste how that feels like if there if there's remorse if there's a feeling like well that didn't go so well let me try to do this better next time that's how you learn that's how you that, so that because the next time you you give yourself a whole day you might be able to remind yourself well kind of venting the desire to um, actually communicate where we get what we want versus just vent is very very different and that that comes down to the kind of clear comprehension of purpose which is mindfulness and clear comprehension and flexibility or suitability it could be that um, for some people that feeling of holding back is actually a loss of self like there's a it's like in an unhealthy way there might be some conditioning where if you hold it hold it back that somehow you're going to um, lose yourself. That might be a pattern that's very hard to break. And so, I, you know, I, I mean, we can both suggest a few things, but one thing you might try, I don't know if you have a friend that like say, I mean, I'm impressed that you could wait that long, right? Like you didn't have to, to vent right away. It, you had time to maybe think about what you might want to say, but something, it's usually a younger part of us that takes charge, like the wise part and the younger part, the younger part wanted to say something, try saying it to someone else. Okay. You know what I mean? Like you could say it to a cloud or the ocean or, you know, a building in Paris, you know, <laughs> or the river, Seine, who knows, but it could be that you have a friend that you could say, can I just like say all this and then see what happens? Like it's, we have to look at the flexibility of experimenting and um, some of these patterns that permeate patience. You know, that's like, you know, when you're close to somebody, how many times do we say things that we have to say, um, can we start again, right? Like, can we start again? Like, can we start again? Like, how many, that's a good thing that I learned in mindfulness practice when I first started practicing it was like, wow, when one person triggers the other person and one person triggers the other person, at some point, somebody has to go, wait a minute, let's stop because it's not two wise uh, adults speaking anymore or people, it's like two young people that are getting triggered that are, you know, not, um, that are hurting each other. So it, I think that ability to, to ask to start again, to speak with somebody else and to um, have a lot of compassion for yourself with this, you're trying. You know, and, and, and also remorse does eventually teach us something. But it takes time. You know, I think about even when Steve was talking about the paramis, I was just thinking about how after a while I, I, I feel claustrophobic in my mask, you know, that you go out with, you know, and I'll have to like, get back <laughs> away from everything, kind of take it off, take a few breaths and, and kind of remember that we're all practicing our goodness and pr protection to like put the mask back on and, you know, go do all the things I'm needing to do. But just that sense of 
um, rather than get frustrated and just this is I'm not I'm giving a different example, but it's it's an easier example rather than just say, well, I'm just going to take it off because it feels good and I don't care right about how I might be hurting other people or myself. It's like I remove myself from the situation, remind myself of why, like protecting others, and put it on again. For, for you, it's like after you say all that, I think it's helpful and feel like, oh, maybe I didn't get what I want. That's exactly the thing. Huh? Yes, that, that's, that's the thing. I didn't get what I want. So that's why it just... <laughs> it de because that style of communication usually turns people off. They, they get defensive, mm -hmm. of course. If you feel attacked, you don't want to listen. And so that's what, that's what eventually changed me, is that I've, I finally realized, actually, this isn't working. And also to know when people talk with me at me like that, I also get defensive. So it's 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 like getting oh when I would rather somebody talk with me in a way that they're expressing what they want skillfully rather than that knee jerk kind of protective defensive energy. Yeah. So I think, you know, when you take that time off, try to get in touch with what you really, really want. And also get in touch with the part that needs to protect itself the old way and really love and care about and protect and love that part that wants to be protected. And then know that you're going to feel vulnerable without it. Right? If you choose to try to be different and not be in the protective old conditioning, it might get really scary. That's where I would put the courage in the in terms of shifting to being vulnerable. I I, I know I went on a bit, but I want to say one last thing is that when when I was kind of learning about about this and always keep learning about this, I think the one thing that shifted for me that was hard is that when I finally got to be able to be okay having a need or a want and try to express it skillfully, that doesn't mean you get what you want. <laughs> I mean, the other part of this is you can do all this and finally like get the guts up to say it and, and do it and try to change. And then like, you don't always, you don't always get what you want, but it's like a much cleaner, healthier, more um, hopeful. It's more hopeful because sometimes you do. And you, and you don't end up um, getting caught in the um, harming. But Sarah, I'm sure everybody's empathizing with this. We all have, we all have this, really, just to know that it's, um, that's why we're in silence on retreat. Practice is humbling. And everything is practice. It's okay to stumble and fall and get up again. Thanks. My favorite thing to say, can we start again? Can we start again? <laughs> <laughs> um, so Amanda had a question and then Julie. So. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Can hear. Great. Um, so my transition out of retreat has been particularly uh, rough, I feel like the last few days. Um, and one thing that seems relatively predominant, so when I was on retreat, I was feeling a really strong um, draw to do some forgiveness practice. I was noticing some resentment coming up, particularly around being on the receiving end of, of some irritability from someone in my life. And I felt like that was really useful on retreat and was trying to bring in a lot of the um, compassion practices and all of that. And then, it seems like as soon as I came out of silence, I have been so irritable. 
I've been, there's been a lot of anxiety, but then a lot of this irritability. And I don't know if there's something about the, like the forgiveness practice that is here. That's like, I'm meant to be learning here, but um, it's been really pronounced and, and not even like, and at a lot of different people or like situations, but that there's been a, a just like this kind of high level of anxiety, irritability, buzz. So I don't know if you have any advice or thoughts on that. Well, first of all, it's totally normal. <laughs> People often experience coming out of retreat and then it's like your protection is gone. You know, all, all the, uh, the safe container mm -hmm. is, is gone. So, so one thing I would ask do you still have the opportunity for solitude every day? Some seclusion? Some, yeah. But sure. not as much as you'd like. <laughs> no, working yeah. on it, moving yeah. that direction. And is there a lot of interaction coming back to daily uh, life? Yes, it's been, I mean, largely on the phone, but yes, a, a fair amount of interaction. And I felt like after retreat, like, you know, particularly with my mom, she's like, wants to talk because I've been on retreat for all these days. But then it, I felt like it was like feeling bombarded. And then I had all this irritability when what I really wanted out of the retreat was to have like the Brahma Viharas and whatever. And I'm annoyed with her. <laughs> yeah. The Brahma Viharas are close. Uh, and I understand. Uh, I, often had a really similar experience coming out of retreats, even really long retreats, even retreats that were all Brahma Viharas. You know, I, I come out and just seem to be expressing the near and far enemies all the time for some period of time. Uh, but I, I found, I, I found restoration if I was able to carve out that seclusion time you know, and just feel it separate the irritability, for example, from the story. Otherwise, it, the story keeps feeding the irritability, the, being able to just feel it as sensation and qualities and how it's, you know, affecting how you see and hear, you know, just make big spaces around it when you do have your, your solitude. Um, yeah, and it's interesting if, the, if for some reason, you sense the forgiveness was has, has been a trigger. I wonder what that is. Have you done forgiveness practice in, before? Um, some. I don't some. think this. Um, not this much. Yep. Um, it was. I don't know. I've had the experience before where something just keeps kind of coming to the mind and on mm -hmm. retreat, and then it's like, oh, maybe that's what I need to, like pivot towards if that just keeps keeps coming up and so it felt really helpful on retreat um like it felt really relevant um but then kind of being blindsided by the amount of irritability that that i was experiencing was uh surprising remember it's a practice so these practices are very purifying. Mm -hmm. So the, the very opposite comes up of what we're, we think, oh, I want to be forgiving. But actually, when we do the practice, the opposite comes up. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point. We, you know how I talk about that, the purity purification, so that we, we want the good stuff. But actually, when you do, when you've had a few moments of forgiveness, that's going to be like warm, soapy water that's washing your heart and mind, and it's going to bring out more irritability. Yeah. And, and so the retreat, you got quiet, you had, you know, it was a powerful retreat for a lot of people. And a number of people have said they've run into some glitches when they came out. It was a big transition. And it's like, I think I would recommend maybe laying off the forgiveness practice a bit and yeah. switching to compassion or, you know, just, just slow the practice down. So it's not 
dr- you're not drowning in um, the purification. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We, it's really funny. We forget. We forget that if you do metta, you get to see a lot of anger. Mm-hmm. And we'll think, well, what's wrong? And it's like, nothing's wrong. It's good. It's really good. We do a lot of mindfulness. You start seeing reactivity and you're like, wow, what happened? Right? I want to be peaceful. But actually, it's bringing out what we need to see. Mm-hmm. And then you slow it down so that you're not unable to work with the irritability like steve is saying do do what he's saying which is to shift to being aware of the irritability mm-hmm. it's good it's great we're all here clapping for you <laughs> that non-opposition aspect of patience is really helpful you know n- not to have a version for the irritability for example because that you might just be feeding it, um, whereas that the attitude of non-opposition or acceptance, okay, irritability is here. What does it feel like? Mm-hmm. How am I feeling? What sensations? How is it affecting other mind states and my consciousness, or how I see and how I hear? You know that kind of investigation, openness, spaciousness. Okay, it's just irritability. We used to add on to the phrase, um, like the forgiveness practice, a phrase, uh, if anyone or any being has harmed me knowingly or unknowingly, I forgive them as best I can at this moment in time. (laughs) You see, like that usually kind of puts a little bit more, right? Getting that sometimes with you know your mother like that's not exactly easy I mean it's like it's not like some neighbor five miles down the street that you hardly know your mother's like deep karma so it's gonna have both sides yes to take a little dose take little doses Mm -hmm. of the forgiveness practice it sounds power it sounds great and powerful Mm -hmm. But no need to drown. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Julie? Hi. Um, I think my question is I want to know if I'm understanding aversion correctly. I think I've been assuming that I do, but maybe I don't. Um, so I kind of experience it similarly to how I experience feelings, um, where it's kind of like a general mist, kind of like a mist off a waterfall if my sensations or, you know, hearing or a thought is a waterfall. So for example, when I was meditating, I was aware that I had a lot of just resistance and aversion. Uh, so then I became curious about, um, like I started investigating, uh, well, what is it that I have so much aversion to? Um, is there more, not necessarily with the idea that, you know, just curiosity. And so then I started feeling my body and I couldn't, uh, you know, and as I began feeling my body, the aversion be- and resistance became less. And the version was like this, kind of just this, like a feeling throughout, like a mist, but it was different than the feeling of the sensations on my body or, you know, anything else. Um, And then I thought, well, there's nothing that I'm feeling that seems so terrible, but I have this strong feeling of aversion. So then I was like, well, what, then I became confused and started going like, do I know what aversion is? What is it? And I had thoughts like, oh, you know, aversive thoughts like, oh, I always feel so much aversion my whole life. And then, um, uh, and then um, when I asked the question, like, what is there a place for aversion? Like, maybe I'm wrong about aversion. And it's not like a feeling mist. Maybe it's actually a, a thing, even though I know it's separate from, you know, the 
negative, positive, neutral thing. So then, um, and then suddenly all my sensations changed and I could just feel these intense, aversive sensations. And then I just wondered is like, this is the sensations, maybe that's causing this aversion, but aversion is, I still thought, well, aversion's a feeling that's kind of added on to those sensations. I don't have to have aversion to these sensations. So then I just sat kind of investigating this, those sensations. I don't know. So what, what do you think of that? And am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Am I, am I really confused? I think you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. I, I think sometimes you're confusing unpleasant with aversion or you're not seeing the difference. You're not seeing that you're reacting to something unpleasant. Unpleasant isn't negative. You, you said the negative, positive, neutral thing, <laughs> but actually uh, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral feeling tone are, are not like negative, um, positive and, and neutral in that sense. It's like that feelings arise, that quality of feeling tone arises every moment of experience. We have no control over it. It's just there. Like right now we're seeing uh, how, how are we doing that? So wh whatever we're experiencing in any moment, we can look and see that either it's just unpleasant or it's unpleasant plus a reaction to the unpleasant, like aversion. So aversion is a reaction. And I think if you use your investigation and curiosity to just kind of relax more and ask yourself, is this aversion? Is this unpleasant? Is this a response that's natural, that's immediate? Or is it reactive, where it's a kind of judgment, aversion to the unpleasant? or wanting you know, attachment to having something pleasant. You see the difference. With pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, awareness of that cultivates awareness and wisdom. Whereas when we're not investigating and we're not being mindful of it, the feelings cultivate reactivity in the mind, like aversion. You know, I guess know. I'm kind of wondering like, what is that reactivity? Like, I, I think I used the wrong words. So I, what I was trying to say was that, oh, I was having sensations that felt, they were like mildly unpleasant, but it was really mild in comparison to this kind of feeling of resistance and aversion. And so then I was like, well, uh, so then I started being investigating and then I had these intense sensations that felt very unpleasant that seemed to match that feeling of aversion. And then I was like, well, am I creating this? Is this how I'm supposed to be doing this? And like, is this idea of like, I'm wondering, well, like the resistance and the aversion, the kind of pushing away feeling, like it feels primarily like an emotion rather than, so I'm just, does that make sense? Like, I'm just, want, yes. just kind of wondering. I, it, it all makes sense and I think, um... On a, on a deep level, I would say that thinking you know, any of us thinking we know what anything is, is not mindfulness. Like, it's like, it, you know, how we'll, like I was discussing how to be with our hands and being careful of having a visual image. And, and, and that I, thinking we know what something is, is usually a cause for not investigating it and being with it in the present. So I'd be careful of thinking that aversion manifests in, in just one way. It will, it can manifest as just one little teeny thought, like we might miss it, but it can be, oh no, or yuck, or, and it might be just that it might not have any, anything else with it. And other times it can be, um, manifest like you say is more like an emotion and it's like it'll sometimes it can be very primal and big and sometimes very little I think that be careful of doubt like what you're describing is sort of a flow of experience that like as Steve says it's it's fine the flow of experience is fine and thinking you're not understanding it and is um 
some of it, I think, is just practice that you get to know that disliking unpleasantness can manifest in so many different ways. And often it is more like an emotion, for sure. But it's not always. Sometimes it can just be a whisper of a thought. So to, just to be careful of landing on this is how aversion is all the time versus getting familiar with um, not wanting and wanting it in relationship to pleasant and unpleasant. You know, it's a very good question and takes time to answer well. It's a really good question. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I think that, yeah, that helps to think that, oh, it's not just one thing. And that actually, yeah. when I think about my experiences, that makes sense because it isn't always this big, huge feeling tone. Sometimes it is just this whisper that disappears and yeah. for sure, yeah. Okay, yeah, and that makes sense that maybe I was getting really, maybe actually doubt was coming up and that's yeah, why I, I was so. starting to question everything. Because, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was already having all this resistance so I might as well yeah. have doubt too. Well, being an aversion yeah. type, I'm, I'm very familiar with <laughs> this pattern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That little whisper in the mind can become very primal <laughs> very quickly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there it. good great what a great yeah thank you yogis from all over the world for coming together yeah. and supporting each other we love you for that take in all your goodness all our goodness mm. Feel free to write into the chat if, as people have been. Mm -hmm.